Good morning. It's good to see all of you here with us today. <clears throat> also want to welcome those who will be worshiping with us virtually from home. Uh, if you did not get a bulletin on your way in this morning, please be sure to get one on your way out. A lot of information in there. Your Bible study guide for the day is in there as well. Just a couple of announcements uh, to share with you before we enter into our worship today. First of all, there are still a couple of cake stands in the foyer from a wedding that was here recently. Uh, if you would like one of those cake stands, please uh, go by the uh, credenza on the opposite side of the bulletin credenza in the foyer and take one of those home with you today. Uh, also, uh, we had a special prayer this past Sunday uh, for Cashton's hearing that was on Thursday. Uh, that hearing has been postponed until August 22nd, so we want to continue to be mindful and prayerful uh, about that upcoming date uh, for Cashton and the Rowland family. Debbie Fuller hopes to be able to go home soon, and uh, there is a list of some supplies in the foyer that that we are going to be collecting to help them out. Uh, that list is on the uh, podium where you get your lesson outlines. I guess I need to come up with specific names uh, for the bulletin credenza where you get your bulletin and the podium and whatnot, but uh, on the podium where you get your uh, lesson outline, you can find a list of those supplies. Those are all of the announcements that I have. Is there anything that needs to be announced that I have failed to mention this morning? If not, then I'll turn the service over to Clay. Good morning. Good morning. Our first song this morning will be 738. 738. We will glorify the King of Kings. We will glorify the Lamb. We will glorify the Lord of Lords, who is the great I Am. Lord Jehovah reigns in majesty. We will bow before His throne. Look upon your face. 
Our Father, we come here this morning to worship you at this place as you've commanded us to do. We just pray that everything we do and say today will be in accordance with your will and your name will be glorified. We realize, Father, we do and say things that are not right. And as we ask you, Father, that you will through Jesus' blood and your grace and mercy forgive us of those transgressions that we may approach your throne in prayer justified. We thank you for Jesus who makes prayer worthy of us. We pray that Jesus has given us an example to live by <coughs> that we will take his word and shape our lives by. We're so thankful for the church he established. We're thankful for here at Corinth for that church all over the world. We pray for those that are teaching in hard places, for our missionaries that we support. We pray, Father, that you will bless them, that they will make success. We're so thankful for everyone that meets here, that supports this congregation. We just pray, Father, that we will grow in spirit and in truth. We're so thankful for your words you've given us. We're thankful for the example that Jesus has given us to, to live our lives by. We're thankful for the plan of salvation that's made known in your word. We're so thankful for our health, for the measure of health that you've given us to be here today, Father. But we pray for those that are not <clears throat> as fortunate, <clears throat> for those who are in hospitals, especially, Father, we pray for Debbie. We pray, Father, that you will bless those that wait on her and nurse her back to health, that you will return her to her rightful place in life. We pray for all those on our prayer list, those on our sick list, so that under a blessing they stand in need of. Those that have lost loved ones, comfort them also, Father. We're so thankful for this country that we live in, all the blessings and things that we enjoy. We just pray, Father, that you will be with our leaders, not only our country, but leaders all over the world, that they will look to you for guidance and wisdom and the decisions they make, that the world can live in harmony. We thank you for the promises that you've made to us. We thank you for the hope that you've given us. Just increase our faith, Father, in those promises so that when our life here is over and you're through with us here, that you'll take us home to that place you have prepared for us. Through Christ's name we pray. Amen. <coughs> Our next song this morning will be on the screen only. You will sing both verses. <laughs> the light of the world you set down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see beauty that made this heart. Oh! 
Thanks for our blessings. <clears throat> 
Most gracious and loving Heavenly Father, thank you for, for all that you do for us, Father. Most of all, thank you for all that we're blessed with. Father, we're truly a, a blessed nation, a blessed group of people. Father, as we get back a portion of what we've been so richly blessed with, Father, we pray that we would do so with a glad and a cheerful heart. In Christ's name, amen. Our next song this morning will be 929, 929. We'll sing all three verses. Father, we And 
It's very rare for people to listen. Whenever someone opens their mouths, it's as if the other person is already trying to formulate what it is that they are going to say in response to that. Well, Paul anticipates the counter-argument whenever he makes an argument, and so he does here. Uh, the argument is based on chapter 5, verse 20, which we have already looked at. In that passage, we are told that in the presence of much sin, there is much more grace. Where sin abounded, grace superabounded. You may remember the analogy of last week of the, the weight of sin, the pile of sin that was placed upon the sinner because of his own choices and his own sin. Uh, that sinner would ultimately be crushed, not only physically in terms of his physical life, the wages of sin is death, but also in terms of his spiritual life, the second death that we also talked about last week from the book of Revelation. And, and so in a physical and spiritual sense, ultimately, every individual would be crushed under the great pile of sin. But in Jesus, that same sinner is made to stand high on the mountain of grace. Instead of being buried under a mountain of sin, he stands high on the mountain of grace. And, and so the argument that Paul is anticipating in verse 1 is that if grace comes as a result of sin, shouldn't we sin all the more so that grace may abound all the more? Individuals might even misconstrue the words of Jesus when He was talking about the individual who is forgiven little, loves little. And to those who make that argument, my response is you're totally misunderstanding the point of both Jesus and Paul. If we have a debt that we cannot pay, it doesn't matter if it's a $10 debt, a $100 debt, or a $1 million debt. If we can't pay the debt, the dollar amount time is, uh, is inconsequential. And sadly, I'm afraid that this is the philosophy that far too many Christians live by today. Uh, there are those who believe that their salvation is eternally secure. It might be because of a belief in the doctrine of predestination, or it might be even on our own shoulders. This past Wednesday, and well for the last couple of Wednesdays, we have been addressing some of those common questions that people will ask members of the Church of Christ. And one of those questions is, why do you emphasize baptism so much? Uh, and the answer to that question is, first of all, baptism is mentioned over 51 times in the New Testament. Uh, beyond that, uh, if you were to wring out your Bible, it would literally drip with water. I mean, it starts with water in Genesis. It ends with either the lake of fire or the crystal sea in the book of Revelation. You have got God providing water for the children of Israel in the wilderness. Uh, it just it goes on and on and on. Literally wring out your Bible, water will come out. But unfortunately, I, I'm afraid that sometimes, and I don't believe we've done this intentionally, but sometimes I believe that we can emphasize one point to the de-emphasis of the other. And yes, that emphasis on baptism has inadvertently resulted in some people believing that the end-all be-all of salvation is the baptistry. Uh, as long as someone can find the baptistry, then they're fine. Two examples of how I would suggest that people think this. When I was in Clarksville, an individual started attending the congregation there. Uh, we studied the Bible with this person. Uh, this person was there Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, the, the whole nine yards. The Sunday that she responded to the Lord's invitation and found the baptistry was the last time we saw her. Never to be seen again. And so just like the doctrine of predestination, the idea is if we can find the baptistry, then we're fine. I was doing a funeral one time with uh, a, a colleague of mine, another minister, and the uh, service was for an individual who had not darkened the doors of the church in 20, 30 years. This individual's reputation uh, within the community was not the greatest that it could possibly be. And those are not exactly easy funerals to do. No funeral is easy. They are all difficult. Uh, 
but there are some that as a minister are much more challenging and it's one when the family friends whatever are concerned about that person's eternal destiny so here was an individual who hadn't darkened the doors of the church for 20 or 30 years his business dealings reputation whatever within the community wasn't exactly stellar and my colleague found a baptismal certificate from 40 years prior and was so relieved that we could ethically stand and talk about this individual's salvation. Now, I'm not standing up here today judging this individual. I do not know this, all of this individual's story. But those are two examples of how we have perhaps inadvertently sent the message that all you have to do is find the baptistry. And so there are those thinking that their salvation is eternal, and so they live far below God's standard, knowing that they can repent at any time, knowing that God's grace, yes, is sufficient. And so since God's grace is sufficient, why bother? Why try? And my friends, that is a very dangerous way for us to live our lives. Because if this is the way that we are living our lives as Christians... It says one of two things about us, and neither of them are all that positive. Number one, it suggests that we have never really repented, that we have never truly been saved by the blood of Jesus, and as a result, our life isn't Spirit-led. Again, all we have found is the baptistry. The other thing that it might say about us is that we just really don't care what Jesus says about how we ought to live our lives. And both places put us on very dangerous ground. If we have not been saved by the blood of Jesus, then the Word of God tells us that hell is our end. And if we are saved by the blood of Jesus, and we are choosing to not care how Jesus wants us to live our lives, then we are doomed to face the chastisement of God. And so Paul anticipates this argument, and his answer to that is both brief and it is clear. And his answer is, if we are dead to sin, how can we continue to live in it? Paul uses the analogy of death for the Christian's life. And while we who are in Christ are more alive than we have ever been, at the same time, we are dead. When death touches our physical bodies, there are certain changes that take place immediately. There are some desires that we no longer have. When the alcoholic dies, when the drug addict dies, that individual no longer desires or craves those things. I saw this the other day. It said, when you die, you do not feel the pain. You do not know that you are dead. All the pain is felt by others. And then the saying goes on to say, the same thing is true when you're stupid. Well, when we die, there are certain things that we are not aware of. And there are certain desires that we no longer have. Death brings with it certain limitations for the person that is affected by it. And the same thing is true for the Christian. Paul says that when we place our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation, when we are buried with Him through baptism, the old man has died to sin. Now I don't want to oversell this case because I know that the old nature still yearns for its sinful expression. It still wants everything that it ever did. The old nature will not change until it physically dies. But when we become Christians, when we are buried with Jesus in the waters of baptism, we, the Word of God tells us, are made a new creature in Him. There is a new man living inside these physical bodies. And he is dead to sin. He doesn't care about it. He doesn't want it. It does not appeal to him in the least. And this is where the Spirit-led life 
comes into play. The gift of the Holy Spirit that we are told becomes ours when we become Christians. The question is, are we quenching that Spirit as Paul told the Thessalonian church to do? If we quench the Spirit in our lives, then yes, the old nature and the old self is certainly going to rear its ugly head and we will not be able to overcome those temptations apart from listening to the Spirit of God. Now some may have a hard time grasping this because it seems to you that you still want to sin as much or more than you ever have. And the secret is to accepting the reality of our passing. Accepting the reality of our passing to sin. And, and Paul in verse 11 shares with us that secret. Here Paul tells us that we must reckon. I love this word, reckon. Uh, some of the more contemporary translations have changed that word not because it's not a good word or not because they're trying to water anything down. It's just because we don't use the word reckon all that much. We use it more down here in the south and other parts of the country, I admit, but reckon just isn't a word that is used an awful lot. But I absolutely love this word. Paul tells us that we must reckon ourselves dead to sin. Uh, this word is an accounting term in the Greek. It is an accounting term which means to calculate. Paul is telling us to add up the evidence and declare ourselves dead to sin. Paul is asking his readers to do the thing that we all do. And that is we have a tally sheet. And, and we will add up or we will subtract we will weigh the pros and the cons, whatever the case might be, and then we will come to a conclusion. And that's what Paul is telling us to do. Look at the evidence, add everything up, and when you do, reckon yourselves, calculate yourselves dead to sin. In other words, God is not going to do it for you. You have to be actively involved. I have to be actively involved in accepting the fact that we have died to sin. And therefore, we are no longer in bondage to sin. Look at verse 14. For sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. God puts the responsibility on our shoulders. It is our responsibility. Once we have accepted the free gift of God, salvation, God says, I have done what I have promised to do. Now you need to do what you have committed to do. And that is reckon yourselves dead to sin. When faced with the pool of baptism, one must first of all accept the reality of his passing. Secondly, when faced with the pool of baptism, one must accept the reality of her position. Paul tells us in verse 3 that we have been placed by God's grace. We have a placement. When we become Christians, when we are baptized into Him, and as a result we are baptized into His death, Paul is not referring here merely to water baptism, but what happens as we receive the Spirit? 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and we have all been made to drink of one Spirit. When the believer is baptized and his sins are washed away, we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And what Paul is trying to tell us this morning is that when we are baptized into Christ, we are placed into the body of Christ. We are members of that body. In that sense, we do not have to place membership at any congregation or any church. Now, it might be important for us to do that so that the elders, the shepherds, know that this individual is someone for whom we are responsible. This isn't someone who's just traveling through town. This isn't someone who's just visiting with family or friends. We are now responsible for that person. But we need to understand a commonly misheld idea, and that is that membership in a church is not what saves us. It is the blood of Jesus that saves us. 
And when we are baptized into Christ, God places us into His family. He places us into the body of Christ. That is not something that you and I get to judge. That is not something that you and I get to determine. You and I are members, yes, of the Corinth Church of Christ, perhaps, but we are also members of Center Chapel, Mount Juliet, whatever else. They are our extended family, if you please. Because we do not get to pick and choose. We do not get to decide. When we are baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of our sins, God Himself places us in the body of Christ. It is not a proclamation that I make or anyone else makes. It is God who places us there by the power of His Spirit. And as a result of us being placed there, we are participants. There is a participation that is ours. Paul goes on to tell us that when we are placed into Christ Jesus, we are placed into His death. Very literally, when Jesus died on the cross, all were placed into His death. When Jesus died on the cross, all those who have their faith in Him also died on the cross. We were, by some extraordinary miracle of God, taken back some 2,000 years, even before we were born, to the cross. When He died, we who are in Christ Jesus died. This is why we can have victory over sin. The child of God is dead. The reason we have so much trouble, the reason we have so much trouble is that many simply will not accept the truth that we have died. Again, the solution to the problem is found in verse 11. We must add up the facts and calculate for ourselves. When we become Christians, we have died to sin. And then finally this morning, when we gaze into the pool of baptism, we must accept the reality of our potential. <laughs> there is a comparison that Paul makes. Uh, Paul makes a comparison and reveals three very important truths for us. Not only did we die in Jesus, on that cross. When He died on the cross, He was dying for sin. And when He died on the cross, we died in Him. When He rose from the dead, we then were risen as well. Just as in Adam, when Adam sinned, all men were doomed, so in Jesus, we have died and been risen. What Paul is trying to tell us is that our lives are intricately connected not only to Adam who brought condemnation and death, but as Christians we are also connected to Jesus. And this is why Jesus told Nicodemus that he needed to be born again. Remember John chapter 3? Jesus answered and said, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. When a person receives Jesus Christ, accepts Jesus Christ as Savior, and peers into the pool of baptism, that person becomes a partaker in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And it is that resurrection that brings newness of life. Ephesians 2, verse 5. Even when we were dead in our transgressions, Jesus made us alive together with Him. For by grace you have been saved. Because He died, we are dead to sin. Because He lives, we are alive to God and to the things of God. And so drawing that comparison between Adam and and Jesus, between death and life, between condemnation and sonship, we have a commission. Again, we are called to live a new life, a different life. Since this is true, the believer should therefore walk in a manner consistent with his new life. Since we have died to sin and been raised to walk in Jesus, in this new life, 
there are some truths that you and I need to be aware of. We have received a command from the Lord in this verse. Verse 4. Jesus, because of His sacrifice, because of His example, because of what He did for us on the cross, our life in Jesus is supposed to be vastly different than our life before Jesus. Here is how that is possible. First of all, we have received a new nature. We read about this in Colossians 10. It's the first 14 verses of Colossians 3. And in those verses, Paul makes it abundantly clear that we are a new creature, or we have a new nature, excuse me. In 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17, Paul makes it clear that we are a new creature. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away. All things are new. So we've been given a new nature. The old man of sin is gone. There is a new man in Jesus. We are a new creature. And then Paul tells the Ephesian church that we are new people. And put on the new self, which is the likeness of God, and has been created in righteousness and holiness and truth. And if this is true, and it is, if it is true that we have a new nature, if it is true that we are a new creature, if it is true that we are a new person, a new man or woman, if this is true, and it is, then why is it that so many people still struggle with lives that are tainted with sin? And the reason is because when we became a Christian, our house became a house of two natures. Our old nature is still in there trying to be king. But now there is a new nature. And that new nature is also trying to be the king. And as long as you and I are alive in this world, there is going to be a warfare going on between those two natures. The old self, the old king, ourselves, and the new king, Christ Jesus. Paul would say that it is not I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And, and so here are these two natures. Our own selfish nature, striving to be king, and Jesus striving to be king. And as long as we are alive, there is going to be that struggle. But Paul tells the Galatians, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. Are those desires there? Yes, they are. But if we walk by the Spirit, we will not carry out that desire. And while there will be many battles, we can win them if we remember the secret revealed to us in verse 11. We must add up the facts. We must calculate for ourselves. We must reckon for ourselves. We must reckon ourselves dead to sin. We need to remember that as children of God, we do not have feet with which we can run to evil. We do not have hands that carry out the devil's work. We do not have a mind that dwells on evil things. We do not have eyes that will look upon and tolerate wickedness. And we do not have a tongue that can be used for evil. If you and I are really saved by the blood of Jesus, then this body belongs to the Lord. And the former occupant is now dead. Therefore, the new occupant, the Holy Spirit of God, can work His will with this old house. It is His. It is no longer ours. Or do you not know, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own. For you were bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body. Well, we've looked at some pictures in the pool of baptism this morning. We have considered how dead men ought to live their lives, learning that we are dead to sin. 
but alive in Christ Jesus. Another interesting thing about a pool is that it can function as a mirror. In James 1, beginning in verse 22, we read this, But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away, and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. And so my question for each of us this morning is this. If you are a Christian, if you have found the baptismal pool and looked into it, yes, even walked into it, when you see your reflection in that pool and you walk away, do you walk away like those who will forget what they look like? Confident that since I have found the baptistry, I am saved? And walk away and forget what being a Christian is all about? Or are you striving to live that life that we've been called to live? Not a hearer of the Word, but a doer of the Word. When we look in the pool, it should motivate us to be grateful to God for all that He has done. And we should strive to live the life that He calls us to live. If you've never gazed into the pool this morning, I invite you to make the decision to do so. Repent of sin, confess Jesus as the Christ, and have your sins washed away through baptism. And if as a Christian you've gazed into the pool and walked away, forgetting what you look like, in Christ Jesus, then I challenge you to peer once again into the pool. Remember what it means to be a Christian. Remember what Paul calls us to and make a change in your life. If you would like for us to pray with you and for you this morning, we'd be happy to do that as well. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation, Jesus invites you and we stand and sing to encourage you. Wonderful story of love and